and um, a little bit uh, about myself. I um, am married to beautiful wife Lydia. We have four kids. We've been married for 20, almost 25 years, and uh, we've been in ministry full time all of those all those years. So for those who know, they know what that means. Um, but I'm not too jaded, so that's good. Uh, we work, we've been in the Middle East for the last seven years. We work with an evangelical organization there. And uh, we uh, share the gospel and plant churches. And we're also a launch team for new people that come into the Middle East. So we've generally got 50 to 70 people um, at a time. And they do uh, full-time language learning Arabic for... Uh, two years and before going out to a church planning team in the Middle East and North Africa. We have about 50 uh, church planning teams and, and people uh, end up going out to those. So we deal with people melting down all the time and, and culture shock, you know, usually goes through two waves, six months and 18 months. Uh, so we function both as an equipping uh, team and a filter so to... to uh, yeah, so, uh, so we're home in the States here for a few months. Um, on furlough, our oldest son has started college, so we're trying to get him on his feet. And uh, so that's why I'm here and glad to be with you guys this morning. Uh, I wasn't personally raised in the church, so I was raised in a uh, radical hippie community. And I consider myself, like my own childhood, kind of two generations ahead of the curve. Uh, and now, you know, I came to the Lord in college, much to, much to my uh, entire family's dismay. And still, to this day, I'm kind of the black sheep of the family for becoming a believer. Um, and now we're at one generation in, since I came to the Lord in, in, the, in, in college in the mid-90s, and... I think one more generation and, and the majority of kids will grow up like I did, which is a very dark and ignorant reality, ignorant of the scriptures and ignorant of the truth of life on earth and its history and its future. And so after I came to the Lord, I really uh, gave myself to understanding what I had said yes to, you know, this... Jew 2,000 years ago that died and what that meant and uh, what eternal life meant and what the gospel was. So that's what I have uh, I've focused on uh, fairly and uh, with a good bit of intentionality for the last 25, 30 years since then. And, uh, and so that's what I'm going to talk about this morning is just a little bit of the historical context for uh, the gospel in the New Testament. And so if you have your notes, um, Luke 3 is a great example of um, uh, what the gospel is. So part of our training in the Middle East is, is training people to be able to say what the gospel is clearly, concisely, directly, and then also to be able to unpack it with, and its complexities. And so we teach people on the front end. Uh, the, the gospel is that the Messiah died for our sins so that we can live forever. And uh, you'll be able to say that directly. You have a 30-second kind of unpacking of it. You have a three-minute, you have a three-hour, and if need be, you have a 30-hour unpacking of what that statement means uh, in its historical context and its implications and what is not the gospel. Um, and so God loves you and has a has a wonderful plan for your life. That is true, but that's not the gospel. Um, God is a healer and heals people. That's true, but that also is not the gospel. Uh, he loves us and wants us to prosper. That is also true, but it's not the gospel. And so unpack, un, unpacking what is the gospel and what is not the gospel and what it meant to a first century Jew has been probably the primary emphasis of my life and ministry uh, over the years. So in Luke 3, John the Baptist, on the notes, that John the Baptist came uh, around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He began to say to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, 
you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Indeed, the axe is already at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So, there, so with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. And so here's an example where you have John the Baptist preaching the gospel before the Messiah comes, before the crucifixion of the Messiah happens, before the resurrection, before Pentecost. Um, and so what was the good news in Jews' minds at the time? And the short of it, the technical phraseology was that the gospel was Jewish eschatology. Eschatology just means study of the end things, the future. You could say it a different way. The gospel for first century Jews was eternal life. But the question is, what was eternal life to a first century Jew? What did they understand by that? And to understand that, you have to understand how Jews viewed the universe and how Jews viewed history. That's what makes ancient Jews different than modern Westerners. They had lots of little small things, cultural things, how they marry and bury and, and, uh, and rituals and that kind of stuff. But on a macro level, on a large level, Jews viewed the, diff- the universe different. They didn't view the universe split in two, material and immaterial, natural, supernatural. They didn't view the universe that way. They viewed the universe as a plurality of heavens, multiple heavens, some three, some five, some seven, some ten, but generally seven, with the earth beneath. And they viewed time different. And so they didn't view the universe split in two, material and immaterial. And the material world has time, and the immaterial world does not have time. That's not how they viewed uh, time or history. So they had what's called an apocalyptic view of history, meaning two ages. Um, <clears throat> and any, uh, any worldview can be apocalyptic. So we're in a period of time in which naturalism has become very apocalyptic, meaning naturalists often will punctuate history into two ages, like everything before the giant asteroid that's going to hit the world and everything after, or everything before we all get microwaved with climate change and everything after. So whenever you have a division of history into two ages, this age and the age to come, or pre-apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic, right? Like a giant uh, nuclear war. There's everything before and then there's everything after. And everything else doesn't matter, right? So Jews in the first century were very apocalyptic and it oriented around this event called the Day of the Lord. And nothing else really matters. Everything else is minor in importance and comparison. Do I have my, do I have my Bible? <clears throat> so uh, I just made this handout as kind of a reference sheet. It's not like a proof text sheet. It's, it's, a, it's a reference sheet for you to kind of, uh, as a resource, uh, so you can kind of go back through and see how these themes developed throughout the scriptures. The main scriptures that develop in the Jewish mind around these ideas. And so the day of the Lord in a first century uh, Jew's mind was paramount. And if you read literature surrounding the New Testament, the day of the Lord, it comes out of the prophetic tradition, but the day of the Lord is, is paramount in how they viewed history and, uh, and, and its importance. So if you flip open to Isaiah 13... I don't know how familiar everyone is with it, so it might be kind of rehearsing for some of you. A lot of times I'll speak and people will come up and say, well, this is the first time I ever heard of the day of the Lord. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> how can you not know about the day of the Lord? <clears throat> so uh, Isaiah 13, verse 6, Weep, for the day of the Lord is near, as destruction from the Almighty it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble, and every human heart will melt. They'll be dismayed. 
pains and agony will seize them. They'll be in anguish like a woman in labor. So this uh, metaphor of a woman in labor is often used in uh, Jewish writings at the time to signify this age and a climactic end, which revolved around the day of the Lord, which ushers in the age to come. And it has a climactic uh, ending negatively in this age. They will look aghast, their faces aflame. Verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation, to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be at dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I'll punish the world for its iniquity, and the, or for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. So the day of the Lord is, uh, this same language gets used throughout the later prophets after Isaiah and then in Jewish literature following between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And of course you get the same language of the stars, falling and the sun um, uh, turning black in Matthew 24, where Jesus is talking about the end of the age. Um, <clears throat> fast forward to the end of the prophets, to Zechariah 14. Flip over to Zechariah 14. So the day of the Lord is pictured as uh, what's called a theophany, an appearance of God. And uh, the day of the Lord is kind of the climactic final appearance of God, which started, I mean, technically started in the garden with Adam and Eve, but really at Sinai. And so a lot of the imagery around the day of the Lord is drawn out of the appearance of God at Sinai with the trumpet and the angels um, and, uh, uh, and that's kind of projected into the future. Zechariah is farther along. Like Isaiah 13 was in relation to Babylon. And the earlier prophets are, the day of the Lord's kind of associated with historical events. But by the time you get to the later prophets, it's more universal. The day of the Lord is a, an all-encompassing reality. So Zechariah 14, and this is just part of kind of the, the progressive revelation of Scripture. And so, Zechariah 14, Behold, a day is coming, verse 1, for the Lord, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be taken and the houses plundered. Skip down to uh, verse 5, Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him, meaning the hosts of heaven, the angels. On that day there will be no light, cold or frost, there shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. Verse 9, and the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day the Lord will be one and his name one. And so the day of the Lord or the revelation of the final kind of uh, revelation of God is the climax of history that history is moving towards. And this event becomes kind of the, the anchor point for what is important to Jews in the second temple period, in the period between the Old and New Testament. And this is evidenced once you get to the, if you read second temple text, but once you get to the New Testament, it's evidenced by the sheer number of times the day of the Lord is referenced in the gospels and, and uh, the epistles which is 64 times, which is a lot of times to be like directly referenced to uh, this event, though it's not talked about much. But pretty much all of Paul's epistles, for example, if you flip to 1 Corinthians 1, pretty much all of Paul's epistles start with some reference to the day of the Lord. And so 1 Corinthians 1 Verse 4, I thank God because of the grace that was given to you 
verse 6, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, the end of this age, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the day of our Lord Jesus Christ is the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the day of wrath, the great day of God, or simply the day. Uh, a lot of times it just gets shortened to the day. Likewise, in the New Testament, the day of judgment is shortened to the judgment, or the day of wrath is shortened to the wrath to come. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That's the day of the Lord, the day of wrath. Um, flip over to Philippians, Philippians 1. So Philippians, similarly, in verse 3, I thank God in all my remembrance of you and all my prayers, verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ, the day of Jesus Christ. And so the day of the Lord is, for Jews, the climax and the end of redemptive history. It's when everything that went wrong in the beginning in the Garden of Eden is going to be fixed and made new at the day of God. So that is the finish line. Paul often uses the race analogy in 1 Corinthians 9 and Philippians 3. The race toward the prize is the day of the Lord. That's the end game. That's the finish line. And at the finish line, the main thing that happens is God makes a new heavens and new earth. So what was wrecked in the garden when God made the original heavens, plural, and earth, God's going to make a new heavens and new earth, the home of righteousness, as Peter says in 2 Peter 3. And this is the restoration of all things. So if you look at... Um, uh, Acts 3, flip to Acts 3. When the, when the, uh, when the lame beggar is healed on uh, John and Peter's way to the temple to pray, they come in and Peter tells all the people that I know what you did when you crucified Jesus of Nazareth. You did in ignorance. He says, verse 17, I know that you acted in ignorance, but as did your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing, which is the, which is the resurrection and the new heavens and new earth in his mind, uh, may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the time for the restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of all his holy prophets from the beginning or from long ago. So the overarching tenor of the prophetic tradition is that God is going to restore what he made in the beginning. Not that complicated of a storyline, but that's the main... God likes what he made. God's going to fix it because he, he loves what he made. He's not just going to throw it away. We throw away what we don't love, right? But we're committed to fixing what we do love, what we do like. And God really likes what he made. And so, um, so he's going to renew it. Uh, the third point on here is the two ages. And so <clears throat> anytime you divide history into two ages, it's a radical thing. It's unbalanced, let's put it that way, because it's vastly overgeneralizing. It's saying that this one thing is the only thing that really matters. And huge empires and armies and big castles and big buildings and huge, all of that is irrelevant because only this one thing matters. And... Muslims do it, Hindus do it, Buddhists not as much, 
Christians have done it on and off throughout history. Jews have done it varyingly throughout history. At the time of the New Testament, it was really intense. But the two-age approach to history is a really radical approach to history. To say that nothing else matters, all this is just this present evil age, right? And the only thing that really matters is the day of God, the resurrection, the new heavens and new earth, etc. And so Romans 8 is a great example of kind of the two-age dynamic where everything gets relativized to that. So he says, verse 17, if we're children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Heirs of what? The new heavens and new earth, right? Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And so Jews, at the time of the New Testament, used the word glory to represent the age to come. Because this age is darkness and brokenness and evil. The age to come is glory and light and eternal life. And so he says, For I consider, verse 18, that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is going to be revealed to us. So the two ages, the present age of suffering and the age to come of glory. And then he goes on to say that all of creation has been groaning since Adam under the curse and death and mortality in hopes for the woman in labor who's going to give birth the revelation of the sons of God. And that is the resurrection in verse, 20, um, verse 23 and not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly wait our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So Jews look forward to the day of God in which there will be a new heavens and new earth and the redemption of our bodies when God is going to restore all things and give us resurrected bodies on a new earth. The righteous, the wicked, it's a different end. But the righteous look forward to the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. So into this hope, the hope of eternal glory, the resurrection and eternal life, that's what we're saved into. And so the next point is the resurrection of the dead. History is moving towards the day of the Lord, a new heavens and new earth, and the resurrection of the body. Because humans were created at the apex of creation, over everything in Genesis 1, right? And so, if God restores human bodies, it represents his restoration of everything. And so the resurrection of the body was kind of, it typified, it exemplified the hope that Jews had for the future. Um, and this is, like I said before, was the primary driver for the apostles. It's what they were looking forward to. It's what the death of the Messiah accomplished. So if you flip to Philippians 3. <clears throat> Paul says in verse 10, he, he uh, because he was a Pharisee and he sought the hope of the resurrection and eternal life on the basis of his own works and righteousness. So he says in verse 9 that I consider all that rubbish that I would be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which comes by faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings. So there's a common theme of sharing in the sufferings in this age before sharing in the glory in the age to come. Becoming like him in his death, in this age, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. And so that's the end game for Paul, is the resurrection of the dead. So if you flip forward to verse 13, he says, One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. And so that's the prize, is the attaining of the resurrection of the dead on a new earth. Does that make sense? The wicked, on the other hand, inherit not 
Well, they do inherit the resurrection, but it's not a good resurrection. There's the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the wicked. And the resurrection of the wicked ends in a lake of fire. But it's not just any lake of fire, like kind of the Greeks thought, where the world is, the universe is split in two, and there's the good immaterial world, and then there's the bad part of the immaterial world with the flames, right? And so that's been a lot of Christian history and tradition that hell is eternal conscious torment in an immaterial world. But Jews, they viewed hell as an eternal conscious torment on a new earth, outside of Jerusalem in the valley of Hinnom, Gehenna in Aramaic. And that the righteous and the wicked would be raised bodily, and the wicked would be thrown outside of Jerusalem in the valley of Hinnom that would be filled with fire, eternally, and the wicked would suffer eternal conscious torment bodily in a lake of fire forever, which is really intense. Uh, But this is the context for the day of the Lord, the judgment, the resurrection, and the age to come. The righteous, however, inherit the kingdom of God, which is the messianic kingdom in a new Jerusalem on a new earth with the wicked outside of Jerusalem in a lake of fire. And this is evident, for example, in Mark, um, in, uh, in Mark 9. So if you flip to Mark 9, starting in verse 43, somebody's quick on the, somebody's quick on the PowerPoint. I like it. Mark 9, which you're familiar with this passage, um, where Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin then cut it off, because it's better to enter the, am I quoting it? I'm just quoting it for, if your hand causes it, it's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, Gehenna, the unquenchable fire. I better just read it. Otherwise, I'm going to, you got the CSB, nice. If your foot causes you to fall, uh, to fall away or sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two feet and be thrown into hell or Gehenna. Next verse. And if your eye causes you to fall fall away, gouge it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into Gehenna where the worm does not die and the fire isn't quenched, which is quoting the last verse of Isaiah 66. For everyone will be salted with, with fire, meaning All human beings are going to stand before the judgment seat of God on the last day, give an account. The righteous will inherit a new earth with a resurrected body in the kingdom of God. The wicked will inherit a lake of fire outside of Jerusalem in the valley of Hinnom. Does that make sense? And again, it's a very straightforward, linear view of history that moves towards a climactic end with two ages. And this is the vast majority of the time when the kingdom of God is referenced in the New Testament. It falls right in line with how Jews expected history. There's about five times where it's questionable, out of 125 times. And we'll probably talk tonight a a little about some of those. I plan to talk about one of them particularly, Matthew 12. Um, And then the last point, messianic agency. This is what it meant to be the Messiah. So Jesus... His proper name was Jesus, son of Joseph of Nazareth. Twice in the Gospel of John, you get that phrase. Jesus, son of Joseph of Nazareth. That's his proper name. So when they assign the term Christos or Messiah to Jesus, this is what they're assigning. Oh, look at that. All right. Uh, They're assigning all these expectations. When, When... when they are running to tell their friends, that, you know, in John 1, that we found the Messiah, and Nathaniel's like, what good can come from Nazareth? And he's like, well, come and see. And Jesus says, oh, here's a true Israelite, in which there's no pretense or guile. And he says, how do you know me? And he says, I saw you under the fig tree. And he goes, you are the, you, Rabbi, you are the king of Israel. And Jesus is like, oh, You believe that I'm going to judge the living and the dead and make a new heavens and new earth and raise the dead and grant eternal life just because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You're going to see much greater things than this. You're going to see the heavens open and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. 
Because that's what the day of God does. It opens the heavens, it cleanses the heavens of wickedness and demons and powers and principalities, makes a new heavens and new earth, and angels ascend and descend over Jerusalem for unending ages. And Nathaniel's like, okay. And that's why they're all following him, right? They're all following him around because they believe that he is the Messiah. And it's strange that the Messiah comes from northern Israel, a week's ride away from Jerusalem. They all talk funny. They got funny accents because they're from Galilee. And so how can the Messiah come from Galilee and he's not educated, his followers are all common, uneducated men. Something's not right about the equation, but it is. That's, but that's why they're following him. That's what the miracles mean to them. Because he's going to do the big miracle, the resurrection of the dead at the day of God. And he's driving out demons because he's going to do the big exorcism at the day of the Lord when he's going to cleanse the heavens and the earth of wickedness and demons and powers and principalities when he makes a new heavens and new earth. This is the guy anointed by God. He's being accredited by God as the Messiah who will do what the scriptures have spoken, right? So uh, that's the apocalyptic part, right? So when Jews viewed the future or eschatology or eternal life, this is what they had in mind was the day of the Lord the resurrection of the dead, a new earth based in Jerusalem. But it's also particularly Jewish, meaning they expected the administration of this view of history to the Jew first and then the Gentile, that God would administrate this, not just independent of humanity. So Muslims have a similar view of history because they picked it up from the Jews in the 6th century, late 6th century in Arabia. But they don't have any Jewish election or messianic expectation. So God's just going to do the day of the Lord and the resurrection in the two ages by himself. But messianic expectation says there's actually going to be a man that's going to execute the day of the Lord, the resurrection, the age to come on behalf of God, a mediator. Right, And this was the whole justification for the apostles that if God is going to mediate the judgment and resurrection in the age to come, he would also mediate death, sacrifice, suffering, and atonement to save us from the wrath to come by that same person. <clears throat> and so this whole idea of mediation plays into Jewish election or the covenant that God made with the Jewish people, that God would administer this unfolding of redemptive history to the Jew and through the Jew, which is offensive to modern Gentiles, right? Because after the Enlightenment, to do anything on the basis of ethnicity is racism, exactly. And so it's very difficult. There's a lot of walls and barriers for modern Gentiles to come to terms. It's not a hard concept to understand. It's a hard concept to come to terms with. How Jews viewed history in the first century isn't hard to understand. It's very straightforward, but it's hard to come to terms with, right? And so Jewish election is one of those concepts that Gentiles find very difficult to come to terms with, that God would administrate the hope of the day of God, the judgment, the resurrection, and eternal life to the Jew first and then the Gentile. And they primarily understood it in a way that we call primogeniture or birthright. <clears throat> Meaning Israel is the firstborn among the nations and will administrate the inheritance of the age to come and the resurrection to the rest of the nations. And so it's a functional reality. It's not a favoritism reality. And so the same way that um, uh, we, we call it executor of a state, in, in, in modern Western terms, but the Jews viewed their calling, some still do, as kind of the executor of, of a state or the firstborn among the nations that will administrate uh, in this age the oracles and at the day of God in the age to come the resurrection and eternal life. And, uh, and so this is, um, yeah, <clears throat> 
Uh, but particularly within that election, the, there's one family within that Jewish people, and that's the Davidic family that is going to be kind of the center of that administration. And so I just made this little diagram to kind of illustrate that the new earth is not just a kind of global Woodstock paradise. The Muslims view this, gardens of eternal bliss. Uh, but that it has very much structure. Look at that, man, you guys are on top of it. That the new earth, when God makes a new heavens and new earth at the day of the Lord in the age to come, is structured around Jerusalem and the anointing of the king of Israel to administrate the resurrection of the body and eternal life to the Jew first, from Jerusalem to Israel to the nations, and then the Gentiles. And this is why, for example, you get mentioned Jerusalem in passing, like in, in Matthew 5. Don't, don't swear by heaven or earth or Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, right? And so the Jerusalem was understood as kind of the epicenter of redemptive history and where the day of judgment and the resurrection would happen in Jerusalem, not just in some place or generic, but specifically in that city. And this is why, for example, in Matthew 19, if you want to turn to Matthew 19, when the rich young ruler says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, follow the commands. And he says, I have. And he says, well, if you actually want eternal life, then sell your stuff in this age and come follow me. Because you believe that I'm the guy that's going to raise you from the dead and give you eternal life. So come follow me and sell your stuff. And he goes away sad because he didn't actually want eternal life, because he was wealthy. He, he, he wanted this life. And Jesus says, I tell you, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's hard, because there's a lot of hooks in this life that keep us attached to this age, because you got to keep the cash flow going, right? And so, so the apostles are like, you know, um, who then can be saved? from the wrath to come. He says, with God, with humans it's possible, with God all things are possible. And he says, what about us? We've left everything because we believe you're the guy who's going to raise the dead and grant eternal life. And Jesus says, as a comfort to them, not a correction or a rebuke or an education, they already knew why they were following him. If the rich young ruler really believed who Jesus was, and what he was going to do, he would sell everything. But he didn't, and that's the point. Jesus' ministry was not to redefine things, but to expose hypocrisy, pride, and pretense. He wasn't revolutionizing what Jews expected. He wasn't changing the narrative. He was exposing religious hypocrisy and exposing pretense. That was the primary thing when you're reading through and his complications with fellow Jews. He's not arguing against Judaism. He's arguing against your righteousness has to be better than the scribes and Pharisees if you want to enter the kingdom of God. Because they fast, they pray, they give to the poor for others to see. And they've received their reward. They won't receive the reward of the resurrection in the age to come, right? So in Matthew 19, the the disciples are like, what about us? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth in verse 28, at the renewal of all things or the regeneration, the new heavens and new earth, when the son of man sits on his glorious Davidic throne, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Because that's what they're looking forward to. And you who have left house, home, family, business will receive a hundredfold even eternal life. And so they all go together. Eternal life, the resurrection, the kingdom of God, salvation from the wrath to come, the son of man, the renewal of all things, the 12 thrones in Jerusalem. It was one climactic, apocalyptic climax of history. It all went together, one package. And that's why, that's why they divided history into two parts. Because there's everything before that massive climax and everything after and everything else is irrelevant. And that's why the return of Jesus was just assumed to be part of this story. That's why the return of Jesus is so important 
in the New Testament, particularly in the writings of Paul, but also Peter and John, because it fell in place with the presumed Jewish narrative or story of history moving towards this climactic end with 12 thrones. And so right after Matthew 19, when the apostles start jockeying for those two positions, because there's 13 thrones, right, in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, and the apostles want those first two thrones. They're not dumb or ignorant or dull nationalists. They have bad ambition, but they're not dumb and ignorant. The 13 thrones are real right after that. And Jesus says, don't be like the Gentiles who call themselves benefactors, but they're actually not. They don't work for the good of others. If you want to be great and you want those two thrones on either side of me in the age to come, then you have to become a servant and lay your life down because it's the father's choice of who gets those two thrones. He never corrects the apostles for the two thrones. He corrects the ambition for those two thrones. And in Luke 22, after the Last Supper, he, said, he adds to that and says, you who have stood by me in my trials, I assign to you a kingdom, and you will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So the 12 tribes saying is kind of the clincher that Jews had this view of the future, and the apostles had this view of the future. And that's why after he's raised from the dead and teaches on the kingdom of God for 40 days in Acts 1, the one question that gets asked, the one question that gets recorded, there's lots of questions that get asked, but the one question that gets recorded is, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you now going to execute the day of God? Are you now going to raise the dead? Are you now going to make a new heavens and new earth? It wasn't like a strange question. It was just the question that everybody's asking. And Jesus says, the times and seasons are not for you to know. Set by the Father. That's the key phrase. The times and seasons set by the Father are not for you to know. But you'll be my witnesses from Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth. Which is an affirmation, not a correction. It's an affirmation that the times and seasons, the appointed time for the, re the restoration of the kingdom to Israel has been set by the Father. But the timing of it is not for you to know. So you have the right expectation, but the wrong timing. Does that make sense? So, as the apostles interpret the death of the Messiah, which is interpreted for them, they don't interpret anything. It's interpreted during those 40 days the death of the Messiah is interpreted during those 40 days as a sacrifice, as, a, as an atoning sacrifice to be delivered from the wrath to come. And uh, I won't go into that because it's a little bit of a complicated unfolding, but whenever throughout the uh, book of Acts, you get it seven or eight times that the Messiah died for our sins and the phrase for our sins um, is out of the sacrificial tradition. So that's what fundamentally what you get in Paul's writings is an extrapolation of what was in that 40 days of teaching. And the new thing is the interpretation of the death of the Messiah for the sins of Israel and then also the Gentiles to be delivered from the wrath to come. But the narrative of history doesn't change. Does that make sense? So when you get to... Uh, when you get to Paul, when Paul is talking about the gospel, Paul is specifically talking about the means to inherit Jewish eternal life. He's talking about the death of the Messiah unto the gospel of living forever as Jews understood it, right? And so, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, by which you're being saved from the wrath to come. Whenever you see salvation in the New Testament, it's always assumed to be in light of the day of God and the day of judgment. So you're being saved, you were saved, you are being saved, you will be saved from the wrath to come, from the day of judgment, to inherit eternal life in the resurrection. 
For I delivered to you of first importance what, that which I also received, that the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day in accordance with, uh, with our sins. He appeared to Peter, he appeared to the apostles, he appeared to the five hundreds, and then he appeared to me as one abnormally born in Acts 9. And we all received the same fundamental revelation was that God interprets the death, the martyrdom of that guy from Nazareth as an atonement for sins in light of the commonly understood Jewish narrative. And that's the heart of the apostolic witness is the death of the Messiah for our sins in light of the return of the Messiah for our salvation, resurrection, and eternal life. And so the gospel in the New Testament is fundamentally twofold. It's the first coming and the second coming for different purposes. The first coming is according to this age. The second coming is according to the age to come. The first coming is according to divine mercy and patience and kindness and love to save us from the second coming, which is according to divine wrath, fury, judgment, resurrection, and eternal life. And so you get this, for example, in Hebrews 9, where uh, the writer of Hebrews is talking about the tabernacle and the sacrifice and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And then he, gets, he climaxes and says in verse 27, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So here's the two age view of history. Just as all human beings descended from Adam are destined for mortality and death. It's not natural, it's not normal, but it was ordained by God that all human beings would die and then face judgment. So this age and the age to come, just as God ordained two ages to history, so the Messiah was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, according to this age and the death of all human beings before the judgment, And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation from the wrath to come to those who are waiting for him, right? So the Messiah came the first time, according to this age, to bear sin. He'll come a second time, not to bear sin, but for a different redemptive purpose. And that is traditional Jewish apocalyptic eschatology. I know that was all jargon to most people. But he will come the second time to do what Jews expected him to do. That's why he's coming the second time. Now, this basic narrative of the death of the Messiah within traditional Jewish worldview and narrative goes through a number of changes after this in the 3rd and 4th century. It goes through a Greek narrative change. And then the 5th and 6th century, it goes through a Roman narrative change. And then those get mixed together and turned around and it's a lot of fun and confusing and maddening. Um, And then you get the resurgence of the Jewish narrative in the late 1800s and early 1900s and has been slowly propagating through the academy and through the church, especially with the reestablishment of the nation of Israel in the mid 20th century. And here we are in the middle of Oklahoma in the early 21st century, talking about what Jews believed in the first century. It is a weird world we live in. Now we know that Jews viewed, had this view of history, this apocalyptic view of history, because we have a lot of texts that tell us this. And these on your second page are your primary historic, well, they're not primary, they're the only historical texts we have. So if you want to know what Jews believed at the time of the New Testament, without ignorant characterizations, which abound, they abound. If you hear anyone say, well, this is what Jews believe, but you don't have actual references to historical materials, don't believe them. Just don't. That weird, like, sword rattling, you know, we want a little kingdom independent from the Romans, that's nowhere in these texts. It's literally nowhere, but it's in every TV show you watch. It's the strangest, strangest dynamic. So anyway, these are the historical texts that you go to, uh, particularly within the Pseudepigrapha, 1st Enoch, 4th Ezra, and 2nd Baruch are kind of the hub. That's what we have the most, tra- the most copies and translations of. 
And those texts, along with the, you know, Life of Adam and Eve, Book of Jubilees, Testament of Twelve Patriarchs, and then further down the list, the Qumran scrolls, the Qumran community was kind of a weird, charismatic, cultic community uh, that didn't really represent the wider uh, uh, kind of popular Judaism at the time. But you can go to these texts, and if you want to know what the resurrection meant to a first century Jew, if you want to know what the kingdom of God meant, what the day of the Lord, what the day of judgment meant to a first century Jew, because these terms are used without explanation in the New Testament. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Because it's better to enter the kingdom of God maimed than to be thrown into Gehenna with your whole body. But you already know what that means, right? We all know what that means, right? I mean, they all knew what that means, but we don't know what that means. And how do we know what that means? Well, you're stuck in a hermeneutical circle because they don't define it. But everybody already knows what John the Baptist is talking about when he says the kingdom of God is at hand. They all know it means the day of God is at hand, the resurrection is at hand, the age to come is at hand, the angels and fire in the sky are at hand. Therefore, repent. Because the axe is at the root of the tree and the wicked are being thrown into the fire outside Jerusalem. But 2,000 years later, and we've gone through a couple changes of redemptive narrative, and it all gets a little bit confusing. So how do you know what Jews were actually talking about? These are the historical sources. And this is how Judaism was broken up in the first century. It's not just broken into four schools of thought. You have normal Jews, just like in the church today, you have normal human beings that are making a living, raising their family, they know how to love people, and then you have weird technical Christians who have spent their whole lives studying theology or whatever, and they have theological camps, and they have, and it's, I know that, right? I'm, I'm that guy. I'm the weird technical guy, right? But Judaism was the same way, where you have different camps that don't represent common Jews. And common Jews viewed history like this. And a lot of the critique that Jesus and the apostles are dealing with is religious pretense and hypocrisy. And when you say that the religious first in this age will be last in the age to come and the non-religious last with bumpkin Galilean accents in this age will actually be first in the age to come, you are guaranteed to get persecuted, guaranteed, for sure. Okay, so that's a little bit of kind of introduction to the Jewish apocalyptic gospel. And the gospel gets fit in, we'll talk, you know, uh, a little bit uh, during the 10 o'clock and at, uh, tonight, how the death of the Messiah for our sins gets put into different narratives and, and different views of redemptive history. But the death of the Messiah for our sins was understood within a Jewish narrative, and the hope of Jewish eternal life, the resurrection of the body on a new earth. And hopefully that makes more sense of the gospel is the death of the Messiah for our sins so that we can live forever. That is the gospel. How you understand that, how you build that out, how you understand it historically, that becomes a little more complex. But keep it around the first and second coming. Amen? Okay. So we're going to take a little break, I think, before things start again. Yeah. Amen. You could keep going, but we'll we'll cut you off. <laughs> All right, uh, bathroom break, um, and find a seat, and we'll start um, at ten. <laughs>